Omori is more than just a game. It's an experience. You know when they say something is a one of a generation experience? Yeah, that's Omori. It's like Undertale, Doki Doki and Fear Hunger in the sense that they all bring something so new to the table to the point where they stand separate from their peers. Omori was inspired by many things, most notably Earthbound, and similar to that, the cultural impact of Omori went far beyond the medium of gaming. Omori's development was taxing and grueling, whilst its release became more and more anticipated. To the point where the head developer Omocat had to shelter herself, as to not get influenced by the ever-growing popularity of her Kickstarter. Whilst this could be viewed as a nice example of dedication, it had negative impacts on everyone, to the point where the game could have easily been cancelled at any minute. However, Omocat's team persevered, and upon its release, the floodgates opened, with the community finding hidden areas, obscure secrets, unreleased builds, and creating a treasure trove of original stories that rivaled the main game. Well, so yeah, some were good, others were, uh, this. However, before we get into that, to truly understand why Omori was so impactful, we gotta look at not only the complex story of the game, but also its grueling development. Omori was originally created as a series of blocks drawn by Omocat, following the mundane activities of a hikik Omori boy. Yeah, see what she did there? These blog posts didn't really have much substance, mostly being limited to white space, with it occasionally giving us a glimpse into Omori's perfectly normal mental state. This continued for two years, and in 2013, Omocast started to create a fully fledged manga. With different characters, wider world, and something resembling a proper plot. This was similar to Omori as we know it today, with it featuring all of our favorite characters. Except for him. Unlike the blogs which had like this random tentacle girl, which will totally not be relevant later in this video, not at all. Despite Omori's obvious potential as a manga, it was quickly scrapped as Omocat had wider ambitions for her work. Omocat announced at the tail end of 2013 that she would be making a Kickstarter for her new game Omori. The Kickstarter was planned to start in winter of 2013, but it started in April of 2014. Wow, a delay? What? Who would have seen that coming? That would surely not become a trend in this video, not at all! As for why Omocat decided to scrap the manga, ironically enough, she wanted to give the viewers the ability to explore beyond the visible pages. And what better way to remove limitations than to make video games? The main inspiration for the game became Earthbound, as she quickly made that apparent with her Art of Aubrey, a tribute to Earthbound. This genuinely looks so sick that I would actually buy this outfit, but you know what I wouldn't have bought? The planned release. Close. On April 22nd, 2014, Omocat released the trailer for Omori, and to say this shit slapped would be a massive understatement. The trailer was such a success that the Kickstarter reached its goal within 30 hours. The hype was unprecedented, as Omocat's choice of music and editing perfectly captured the nature of this game. It also hinted at its uh, aptitude for mental torment. The small team was optimistic, ecstatic even, because for Omocat, making this game would mean the world, and now she has all the tools she would ever need. A Kickstarter, an intrigued fanbase, and most importantly, a passionate team of developers. The world is theirs, they can have boundless creativity and work with everything. The team felt like they were on top of the world at this pace, and with this newfound morale boost, a projected release date of May 2015 was announced. And, oh boy, how wrong they were. 
Many of Omori's environments, ideas and stories were all well planned. The main integral parts of the game, such as environments and headspace, were inspired by Omocat's dreams, along with lucid dreaming. But despite this large, pre-existing foundation, as the development went on, the game just didn't stop becoming bigger. The development continued and more was added on top of the game. It was not being finished. Despite the team hiring various JRPG maker specialists, the scope of the game kept on inflating whilst time was running short. Just like this video! As I'm writing this, it's 8,500 words long! Haha, <laughs> this video will never end! As hard as it may be to believe, Omori was never intended to be a 20 hour experience, but nonetheless, the team officially had to announce a massive delay, pushing the game's release back nearly 5 years. During all of this, Omokat was mainly the director, writer, and artist for Omori. But if that wasn't enough, after the game's delay, she had to become the head programmer as well, spending countless hours a day to ensure Omori's proper creation. As a way to actually fund this half a decade long development, Omocat returned to selling merch, because the Patreon money ran out. Yeah, that amount of money is enough for us Western Europeans to live for like 5 years. <laughs> Omocat eventually had to announce another delay, which sparked a lot of controversy and worry about the game's creation. This was mainly a factor of two things. One, infrequent and improper communication on the part of Omocat, and secondly, a half a decade long delay. Now Omori's developers needed to focus on not just the game's creation, but also a all new original DLC boss character, Allegations! Nah, nah, that, that, not Twitter this time. People started to really get upset at Omocat, thinking that the dev team ran away with the money. This exaggerated by the infrequent updates about the game's progress made the flames a lot, a lot worse. This trailer would be the last one for Omori, marking Christmas of 2020 as its official release. As the date grew closer and closer and closer, a 24 day countdown began. Illustrations made by Omori's dev team started to surface the web, and finally, on December 25th, 2020, the game was released. Once you boot up the game, the very first thing you see is Omori, with the iconic white space behind him. The game begins with a very cryptid messaging. It's a stark contrast to the main menu. Now everything is dark, warped even. It's apparent that something is very, very wrong, with Sunny breaking down. This essentially foreshadows the entire story and has either the fanbase uh, uh, crying or livid right now. You'll understand what I mean soon. We're immediately thrown into white space, a bridge between headspace and the real world. There's not much to do here, but some things do hold secrets, like the perfectly normal, not schizophrenic laptop. You can talk to the Kitker Kurva and look through the... Yeah... After jerking off a little bit, something appears nearby. A knife. And after picking it up, you can go through a white ghostly door. This is Dream World, appropriately accompanied with the cheery visuals and bubbly music. Here you meet three of the five main characters, Aubrey, Hero, and Kel. This is yet another tonal shift that frankly kept me stunlocked, yet surprisingly intrigued. Every single time we changed something, it had massive implications on the story and my perception of the game. But this feeling of uneasiness was infrequent, because the game kept the contrast far apart as to not ruin the magic. But when it hits, once you receive clams from the kindest Polish oh, resident, you can explore around. Most areas are blocked off because Omori is a crybaby, but if you go up to the shore like how I did... In this world, there are many abnormalities and disturbances that frankly do not align with the bubbly aesthetic Dreamworld tries to sell us on. The biggest example of this is the 26 letters. Whilst there are 26 letters throughout the world, you only need to gather a select few to complete the hangman puzzle. As for what the answer is, you'll find out soon enough. 
Also, I, I just realized it's called a hanged man. I just realized what that implies. Oh god. For now, let's just stop traumatizing ourselves and proceed to a picnic where the fourth main character is introduced. Mari, Omori's older sister. While not being a playable character in the story, she serves a far more important purpose. She provides a resting spot for you and the gang to save the game and also replenish your stats. By the way, I did not know that these baskets saved the game, so I just replayed one hour of this fucking game three times. I thought the game was bugged. To give you some information about the group, Mari and Hiro are essentially the main caretakers of the group, looking after the much younger boy wonders and Aubrey. Here is also where you meet Basil, the, the femboy. He is perhaps the sweetest little devil as he takes photos of everyone in the group, capturing these priceless moments for him to relive. These photos are just, I don't know man, they developed these characters so well and honestly, it's something about them just having fun, captured with that innocence and youthful spirit. It almost takes you back to a simpler time, happier times, and instantly makes them relatable. Not that I would know, I live in fucking Eastern Europe. My friend saw my apartment building and called me a fire punch resident. He said I lived in fire punch, bro, what the fuck? In this area, there's also this really shitty hide and seek section where you can't escape. Trust me, I tried. But the most notable part here is how Kel intentionally gets caught by you so that he can help you find the others. Kind of a snitch, but Kel is best boy, trust me. After you find everyone, you discover that Basil has been captured by this thing. I, I don't know what it is, but now we have to kick its ass. <laughs> yes, genocide love, baby. Omori's combat is very simple on the surface with its traditional turn-based JRPG mechanics. Most notable change here, however, is the emotion system. The emotion system is basically a rock-paper-scissors mechanic where certain emotions have a buff and debuff against each other. What I find interesting in this is not the actual combat, but rather the story implications. Omori is depressed, so he can make others depressed with his shitty poem. Aubrey is cheerful, so she cheers everyone up. Whilst Kel just annoys people. I swear, Kel is best boy, believe me. After showing this dude that he has no enemies, we are prompted to go to Basil's house. Um, give me a second. Once we enter his house, that's when shit hits the fan. Basil in his house sees a photo that he didn't take. But this photo is very familiar to him. He doesn't recognize it, but it's... Then he realizes. Things from the opening are slowly piecing themselves together. The photos, Basil's terror, Omori's interactions with him, everything is coming together. This is the second brainfuck moment I had with this game, and the third one was right around the corner. In this section, you're essentially stuck. You can talk to the cat, you can do whatever you want, but you cannot get out. Until you open your inventory, and a new option appears. Stab. This is the point where I was confident that Omori was a game that was 100% worth finishing. Once you commit seppuku like a true Hikamori, you wake up in the middle of the night, starving. This is no longer a dream world. This is when the horror part of the game really kicks in. Everything is quiet, too quiet even. Nothing can be heard, aside from the deathly ringing of silence in a hollowed home. You are alone. No one really knows for how long you've been alone because the only message you have is your mom telling you to do chores. Once you start reluctantly going down the stairs, shadowed hands appear. Then a realistic one grabs you from behind. And once it catches you... This... Oh, oh boy! This is one of the more twisted things in the game, known as something. It's unbeatable as it is all in the head, but you can attack it, although it has no effect. Only by calming down will it actually disappear. But you don't gain any experience, loot, or money. You just lose your health. This is really the real world now. After going into the kitchen and eating a frozen microwaved steak at 3 a.m., what the fuck is wrong with you? Someone knocks on the door. It's Mari. It's actually Mari. Hey, best girl, how you doing? I've been so lonely. Sure, come on by, of course. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> that was an amazing interaction, guys. That's... I totally don't spell shit right now. After going through that, Sonny somehow has the courage to actually go to sleep. And then, you reawaken into white space. Upon going through the door, your friends alert you on how Basil is missing. And thus, the main plot of the game begins. Basil is lost, so we gotta find him. After talking to Mari and consulting our fears of heights, we take the comedically large stairs to the moon and look for him there. We somehow get entangled with a desperate simp who's dealing with a breakup, so we gotta find his mixtape written with the most alpha male Giga Chad music. Why the fuck are we doing this? Don't ask questions. We look, we look, and look, and it's chill. This, this is surprisingly nice. This is small moments like this is where you can really vibe with the characters. Between the Lovecraftian girlfriends, a side quest, and a whole bunch of yapping, you have these relaxing moments where you can just chill and look at the radiating mood. Whilst I do love the character development that happens here, something more important happens. We fight a Windows XP error code and then mug a sprout mole child. <laughs> yes! Once we take the tape back to Space Boyfriend, he wakes up and fights us. Like a true Hustlers University graduate, baby. We fight until we beat the toxic Sigma out of him. But then... No more filler. This scene is perhaps one of the most relatable aspects of any game writing I've ever seen. A lot of games try to capture relatability with many things, such as a fucking isekai, shitty backstories, but not many try to draw parallels with just good childhood memories. One of my favorite relatability tools are these Instagram reels describing Eastern European life, but my second best one is lines like this. Watermelon is the best part of summer, not knowing what to wish for in your happiest moments, or even complimenting a family member's cooking. I don't know what it is, but these lines just hit way too close to home, man. At the end of this section, you arrive at the barn, which is a gateway to another abnormality event. Entering it, you'll find a devoided space with nothing to see aside from a long, long flight of stairs. At the end of that staircase, you'll find memories and a music stand. But once you turn your back, that thing appears again, along with Basil. I think this is the point where the whole structure of the game changes. This specific component of the game, it being able to throw different things at you at a consistent basis, is just amazing to me. Omocat doesn't allow anything to become stale. Haha, <laughs> no, no wonder this game almost took a decade to make. As we reawaken, we're once again met with a knocking on the door. This time it better not be a Freddy Fazbear jump scare. It's actually Kel! Wait, open the door? But the last time we opened it, here you have a very important option. It's so important that it might split your game into two different routes. Yeah, that's an Undertale reference, baby. If you don't open the door on day 3 and 2, you'll be stuck with the Hikikomori route, where all the real-world content is removed in exchange for more schizophrenia. But if you open the door, well, let's say it gets fascinating. Kel is actually surprised that you opened the door. He wasn't expecting this. You haven't left your home in three years. Not ever since... But the fact that he still hasn't given up on you speaks volumes on just how much he cares about you. Also, uh, Aubrey is a f bitch now. Remember Aubrey, that sweet, innocent, loving little cinnamon roll? Yeah. Well, she's now as much of a punk as you could possibly get. Armed with a bat decorated in nails, hair dyed purple, eyes piercing as spears, and an attitude fitting that of a villain. This is where you find out that the relationship present in your dreams was no longer real. The first time you see Aubrey, she is bullying Basil and tormenting him. Naturally, being Sigma Gigachat males, we intervene. This triggers such a stunning fight, it's so good, and the music is equally amazing, holy f why does every JRPG game cook with the music? One thing you need to consider here is that this is the real world. Your attacks deal real damage not only to actual people, but also your friends, with each defeat and victory shaping dialogue and perspectives of each character. The accompanying music doesn't help the intensity either as you and Kill start to lose this fight. But there is one option though. 
But are you sure you want to go through with it? As Omori slashes Aubrey, the fight is cut short. She calls you a psycho for being armed and leaves along with her goons. But with all honesty, that was amazing. Surely the game won't cause the pacing to crash to a screeching halt? Of course not! I mean, come on, after that fight? No! Here's where you find out that Aubrey stole Basil's photo album. So now you have to do a shitty filler of beating low gangster to find her location. Not once, not twice, but three times. This is probably the slowest part of the story for two reasons. Firstly, it is wedged between two of the best scenes in this entire segment. And also, all of these characters are f***ing infuriating. They f stink. So let's just uh, skip over them. Aubrey can be found at this church where we finally get answers to what happened in the past four years. Kel, Aubrey, Hiro, and Basil are all from Sunny's friend group. He pictured being with them as his perfect dream world. But there's also Mari. But she... she is, uh... Mari passed away. And as a result, Sonny hasn't left his home in years. Kel distracted himself with sports. Hero moved on to university. But Aubrey? She just had to watch it all happen. Her friends left her one by one, having to deal with her whole world being uprooted without a relief in sight. She's upset now that after all this time, after all these years, Kel is trying to make amends. After she handily whoops your ass, you grab the photo album from Aubrey's trash bin and give it back to Basil. After finding out that all of this happened in the last four years, these photos, these treasured memories, they hit different. They feel like distant dreams now. It's no longer something you could relive. Pictures of you and your friends goofing off, having a picnic, a birthday party, a sleepover, it's a time capsule, signifying a better period, a simpler time, but something feels off. Mari is nowhere to be found. Basil wants you to have this photo album as a gift, but he didn't realize that you were also leaving. And upon hearing this, Basil starts to break down. As you follow him into the bathroom, you see him murmuring to himself as a something appears behind both of you. You quickly leave Basil to sorrow in his own despair. Once you go back to your dream world after fighting the least corrupted stick bug, you can no longer really look at the dream world the same way. The truth is seeping into everything slowly. Dark figures start to appear around the world, giving you insight about dreamers, about you, why this place was made, and how Basil no longer exists in the dream world. Your friends now, desperate to save Basil, are slowly but surely starting to forget about things. I think this is the point where the game honestly starts to become unbearable. In hindsight, it does make sense. You start going on the castle, where you frankly have no business being, doing side quests, taking part in racism, and usurping the castle. But something is always watching you. Apparently this area was planned to be fully optional, but Omocat really liked Sweetheart's body pillow <coughs> design, so she made it mandatory, and I hate it. The library in which you unironically commit a racial crime. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even joking, one of the side quests is you gathering certain colored sprout moles who are identified as lower class and then imprisoning them. In this now abandoned library, crawling with spiders, you'll come across various books which give you tidbits of lore about the story, describing happy memories with you and your friends. At the bottom of the staircase, you'll find an illuminated doorway, and once you go inside, you're greeted with a cutscene of Basil, uncovering something truly horrific. A key under the toy box. You're back to white space. I think you already know the drill by now, you can't escape, so it's time for a session of acupuncture! The most notable aspect of this day is Basil fucking drowning. You and Kel arrive at your former hangout spot, which is now taken over by Aubrey's goons. And of course, they're bullying Basil. Whilst Kel tries to talk sense into her, she accidentally pushes Basil into the lake. After facing your fears of drowning three times, a scene plays, which hits way too hard considering how short it is. 
Mari appears almost as a guardian angel to guide you out of this black space, and as to continue that work, Hero appears to help you and Basil out of the water. No harm is done, but this seemingly puts a far larger gap between everyone. But hey, look at the bright side! You and the boys get to have a sleepover now, let's go! On this night, other parts of the house which were previously inaccessible can now be entered, in the colluding Mori's studio. This piano was Mori's prized possession, with the words Omori etched into it. She and Sunny were supposed to perform as a duet, with Sunny playing on the violin, but yeah. Hiro reminisces about his time with his friends and how Mori liked to play the piano for everyone. Seeing Hiro genuinely try to perform her favorite song, it's it's one of the best things I ever got to see. I, I, I don't know, but the emotion in every keystroke, the effort of pulling back the tears, you can you can almost feel it. And fuck me, I'm about to tear up. Nah nah nah, nah. It's, it's too early for that. What just happened? Huh, that, that was strange. But something is wrong. Something seriously wrong. There, there, where is everyone? No one's here. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's a long story. So basically, montage time. Everyone was tricked into signing contracts, and according to the agreements, they have to work for free with no pay for years. This is basically the child slavery portion of the game. Yes. You now have to go and save them, but not before Mari disappears. Where is she going? Why is she going? What the fuck am I gonna do with my saves? Uh, yeah, she's still here. But not really. Anyway, we go to the casino, become the Florida Yoink Man, beat up the planet Pluto, and save everyone! Yeah, now we can finally go home! But, uh, weren't we supposed to do something? I forgot. Oh well. Hey look! That bitch princess is right there! The one I intentionally wrote out of this script, cause f*** her. But why are we chasing after her exactly? Something's off here. Oh look! A whale! Oh look! Sexy chicks! Hell yeah, finally some entertainment. There's enough for me to go around. I'm gonna be enough for three of them. Hey look! A whale! It's eating us! Again! Murder it now! Wait, what are we doing here exactly? Why are the plants telling me about hiding the truth? Wake up? What could you possibly mean? A white space is a place I use as a shield? From... You're teleported to a blacked out, colorless, lifeless version of Faraway Forest. There's not much to do here, except to proceed towards another flight of stairs. And at the top lies Mari. Ironically, the only source of life in this desolate realm is her lifeless corpse, sitting atop glistening flowers. After she casually assaults you and then becomes a door, you're teleported to another location. Welcome to Black Space. All the keys you've been collecting were an amalgamation of your deep-rooted, dark memories emerging, bit by bit, letter by letter, until it swooped across everything. This is essentially the final stretch of the game now. Black space is the opposite of white space. Instead of your memories being suppressed, they're bubbling up, with each door representing different moments and emotions. In some, Basil pops like a melon. In others, he gets eaten alive by spiders. Oh, so, so cool! But in most cases, it uncovers the truth. You and Basil did something very, very bad, to the point where your safe space is slowly eroding from the inside. After your first dream, Basil was never here, because he is at the center of this mystery, so your mind cleared all traces of him as to not make you remember what happened. Towards the end of this segment, you come face to face against your alter ego, the other half of you, made for the sole purpose of keeping you in headspace. Uh, look guys, it's all in the head. You wake up again, in the middle of the night, but for the first time in years, you're not alone in your room. Kel is right there sleeping soundly, oh my sweet little whopper, but Hiro, well, he's downstairs. 
If you go down to Mori's studio, you won't see him, but rather, you'll see Mori, asking you if you want to play again. As she disappears, a hero rushes in, being startled by the notes she was making. When he enters the room, he'll talk about how he misses Mari, and how he regrets not keeping an eye on her. He can't begin to fathom why Mari would leave all of them the way she did, but he is sure that despite everything, she'd want all of them to be happy. After telling you that with a smile, he asks you to get some rest, but if you walk out and walk back in, you'll see Hiro crying over Mari's piano. With the just the two words, this scene... I, I genuinely have nothing written for this segment. I, When I had to watch this segment for the first time, I felt like shit. When I had to relive through this segment a few times for the sake of this video, I still felt like shit, because this is probably the best depiction of trauma and grief I've ever seen. It's something you would see everywhere, so many people that are responsible, stoic and trying to help others in every way they can, suffer internally. But then they never ask for help, because they are the help. A 2D JRPG pixelated game with sprites and small text block animations makes me want to just reach into my screen and pet this little guy and tell him that everything will be fine. And the fact that this game is making me feel like that, it just goes to show how amazing Omocat's writing really is. Hey sleepyhead, you're the last one up. Go downstairs, cause Hero's cooking up a meal. Just make sure Kel doesn't eat all of it. For the first time in who knows how long, you actually get to eat a proper homemade meal. You've been eating microwave steak for who knows how long now and, well, this is a good change of pace. This is perhaps the only time you've actually felt comfortable in your house. Ever since Mori died, this place has been cold, dangerous, and hollow. You guys feel like family, but someone is still missing. There's a reason as to why Aubrey's like this and why she's mistreating Basil. Picture yourself like this. A close friend passes away, and all of your other friends start drifting away. From your perspective, they seemingly move on, but you're still there. Now imagine yourself trying to relive those memories through photos, only to find out that they were desecrated. Basil drew over Maury's photos. Aubrey was absolutely baffled and furious as to why Basil would even go through with this, to the point where she never let go of that grudge for years. Despite Aubrey being able to save the photos, it took a lot of work on Heroes End just to bring the whole team back together. And eventually, you guys convince Aubrey to forgive Basil. This selfishness is one of the main reasons why a lot of people hate Basil. I kinda dislike the little fanboy myself, but for other considerably worse reasons. We'll get to that. But first, it's photo time! As someone who moved out from university, is studying, working, and not seeing most of my old friends, I can genuinely understand virtually all of these characters' feelings, interests, and transformations. Things happen, and as a result, those bright memories can never be relived. Whether that be through loss, falling out, or melancholic distancing, life leaves its mark. Omoka does such a brilliant job at making these characters relatable, while not being cheesy. These illustrations, no, 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 these people, enjoying each other's company and creating priceless memories that will last a lifetime is truly beautiful. At the tail end of the game, you find out the truth about everything. At Basil's home, you and your friends are waiting for Basil to come out, to make amends for everything and relive those good times, even if for just a single day. Once you fall asleep, however, your headspace shatters. You're transported to areas where you collect different pictures. These pictures depict what happened on that day. There's a violin on the ground. Sunny's precious violin is shattered. Maury and Sunny bicker atop the staircase as their bickering becomes physical. Sunny pushes Maury down the stairs, albeit by accident. Maury's lifeless body lands at the last step at Basil's feet. Sunny rushes down in a frenzy to check on her, but she is motionless. Basil and Sunny, in a panic, take Mari up the stairs. 
and she won't wake up. The sun is becoming more and more unstable, curling up in a ball and starting to cry. I have to save Sunny. Basil convinces Sunny to take Mari in the backyard. With their bloodied hands, they carry Mari's loose body outside as he grabs a jump rope. And... Basil only wanted to save Sunny. He wanted to keep him safe, but none of them knew that she was still alive. That thing appearing all throughout the game was Mari's head, constantly reminding you of the sins you've committed. That thing is the representation of your guilt that could drive you to ending your life. You wake up, armed with the truth, with a decision to make, to save Basil or let him be. If you pick the former, you fight Basil, who also has something chasing him, a visual representation of his guilt eating him alive. For the first time in ages, you get to remember truly how it was all those years ago. You get to relive the best times of your life, with you, Mari, Kel, Aubrey, Hero, and Basil just being friends. You guys go on a picnic, go to the beach, eat watermelon, and have fun. Fuck me, I'm about to... Two of you now have to fight, as both of your grief starts to eat you alive. You don't know why you're doing this. Why are you best friends trying to kill each other? Is it just a coping mechanism to dull the pain and grief? Why are you fighting? You lose consciousness, and in Headspace, you've come face to face with your alter ego. Omori. Omori is a mechanism made by Sunny to suppress memories, confiling you to a fake, dreamy and flawless world. For the past four years, you and Basil have hid the truth from everyone. You kill her. But this is your chance to at least tell the truth. After a grueling battle, Sunny is able to overcome his alter ego. And this sequence plays. The OST you hear right now is the duet, meant to be performed by Sunny and Mari. Words can't describe just how beautiful this section is, and I've played this clip many times in this video before, but, but I think it hits a lot harder when you know the full context of things. You wake up in a hospital, decrepit, bruised, destroyed, yet hopeful. You make your way to Basil's room, and here you find everyone, and decide to tell the truth. Throughout the entire game, Sonny hasn't said a single word, yet, at the end, he says the final five words of the entire game. I have something to say. And that's virtually it for Omori. Minus the whole secrets, uh, different route, cut content, beta build, and... Uh, yeah, there's a lot to cover. But I won't cover all of them here. The only reason as to why I spent the whole 20 minutes just going over the entire story was to draw the full picture. You wouldn't understand a lot of the reactions, creations, and cultures surrounding this fanbase. Without understanding Omori, you wouldn't understand just how dedicated, starved for content, and the terrifyingly massive this community is. Omori's story has two grey areas, with one of them being completely up to the viewer's perception, the years before and after Mari's death, and the reaction your friends have regarding the truth. Whilst we do get to see a lot of photos, flashbacks, and callbacks about Sunny's brighter past, we don't really get to see day-to-day -day activities of him and his friends, we only get to see core memories. And that is when Faraway Logs comes in. Also, um, before we get into that, there's like this uh, arena shooter about Aubrey shooting people up. It's a first-person game. I, I don't know, it's some fucking brain rot shit. 
Faraway Logs is one of the most well-made, intriguing and faithful pieces of fanfiction I've ever seen. Rendered in the style of Omori's real-life combat segments, Faraway Logs is a YouTube series made by Jay following the daily lives of our favorite characters. Faraway Logs takes place before and during the events of Mari's death, a period of time we mostly get to experience through photos and conversations. JC took full advantage of this and really expanded on the timeline of Omori, building foundations for the main game's events and breathing new life to these pixelated characters, revisioning them in this completely new and intriguing light. This fanfic is fully voice acted, animated and characterized, and to call it a simple fanfic is kinda just doing it a disservice. This series avoids a lot of the cringy things associated to fanfics, like altering the characters, revisioning them through rose-tinted glasses, or even changing the events of the story. The characterization, innocence, and intimacy captured by faraway logs is something to be admired. These characters are like actual children or teenagers, innocent and awkward. But as I mentioned, it takes place during Mari's death. The series can get pretty dark, especially with this phenomenal voice acting and 3D visuals. It's one thing to see black space with pixelated graphics, but this, it hits completely different. There's a bunch of one-frame easter eggs scattered throughout the clips, so if you're a diehard Omori fan, you'll most likely enjoy every aspect of this series. But there is one bad news. It currently has 13 small episodes, with the latest one being released 7 months ago, so the future of this project is unknown. If the video format isn't quite scratching away at that itch, then look at Omori Autumn Break. Omori Autumn Break is developed by Pyro, uh, n n no, not that one, and Cool Dry 77? Uh, this guy. This game is very similar to Faraway Logs, as it takes place before the events of the main story. Here, the focus is more on the wider relationship between Sunny and Aubrey, along with Hiro and Maori. It's a fun little story that usually doesn't tend to get too dark. I feel like this mod mostly does stay very faithful to Omocat's vision, rather that be with the story, art, or even the combat. What I wasn't expecting, however, is the final segment of this entire game. We're back right before disaster struck. Sonny's playing the violin, over and over, but he doesn't improve. Sonny gets frustrated and storms off as Mari chases after him, but it's already too late. The violin is smashed on the ground. But before we continue, there's one thing I really have to criticize about this mod. It is a 5 hour long mod after all, so there's got to be a lot of issues, but the thing is, it kinda messes up on one of the most fundamental parts about Omori's story. As we get to see in this segment, when we discover Mari in her room, we get to find out that maybe Mari pushed Sunny way too hard about the violin. She was a perfectionist, so maybe that rubbed off on Sunny. It is implied that they developed a slight toxic relationship, but here, we just get to see Mari being super friendly and nice to Sunny, cheering him on and calming him down. This doesn't give me the same vibes the story tried to tell, but nonetheless, the following sequence, it's pretty fucking good. You have a boss fight against Mari, but what hits even harder is the fact that when you attack her, you do no damage. But when it's her turn, she doesn't hurt you. She tells you to calm down, that's her attack. Her telling you that she loves you, that's her move, but nothing gets to you, and you push her down the stairs. Keep in mind, this is still a mod, so if you're coming in here with some amazing expectations, don't. But, if you really want more Omori content, check it out, I do recommend it. The Omori community made dozens, if not hundreds of animations depicting different segments of the story, from comedic takes on Omori's Hikigomori life, which is animated way too well, then you have some absolutely madness shit, and all the way down the rabbit hole, you'll find the somber stories about Kel and Hiro. In this animatic called Hero and Kel's Grief, we see just how badly Mari's death affected Hero during the four years we skip in the main story. He abandoned school life, social interactions, and became a depressed Hikigomori. Kel confronts Hero about the state, and Hero explodes in a mass of rage and anguish. It's a side of Hero we never really get to see in the game. In Omori, Hiro is always the adult of the group, he takes care of everyone, and very rarely does he ever show weakness, so ultimately seeing him like this, it just, it hits different. This kind of gives you a good understanding of how a lot of people in the Omori community just want to make more stories about Omori, and uh, 
The game has plenty of fanfics about it, and I mean plenty. There are hundreds of fanfics changing, altering, adding and removing different parts of Omori's story. Omori is a 20 plus hour game with incredible amounts of secrets to boot, and that gave a lot of these people ample amount of content to work with. They made their own genres like what if Mari survived and what if Basil took the blame. It's insane. Some of these creations are like 30,000 words long like Estran- Like Estran- Like Estran- Like And the Pursuit UA. I was about to cover both of these, but then I realized how there is not much material for visual editing, so I'm just gonna tell you this. In Pursuit UA, Mari dies, Hero gets a dream, then Hero gets obsessed with protecting Sunny to the point where he literally drugs him and keeps him tied up, then Kill comes along and saves him, but now Sunny is like having to deal with other insane bullshit and trauma. Yeah, yeah. If you think drugging Sunny is messed up, you know what's even more messed up? Not having Omari too. Omori's ending left a lot to be desired for a lot of people. While some were content with Omori's ending, capping the story off by telling the truth, a lot of people weren't happy because we didn't get to see what happens after that. It's so interesting to think about how all of these characters would react to Sunny and Basil killing Mari. Kel tried so hard to keep the group together. Aubrey basically changed her entire appearance because of Mari's death. And the hero loved Mari. So what would their reactions be towards the truth? Hero's Fever Dream is on the shorter end content-wise, compared to most other entries. It takes place seconds after Sunny's reveal about the truth, as Hero descends into his own headspace. In here we get to see absurd levels of Hero Copium, with glitching landscapes, fights with himself and his future life. This boss's name is Taxis, and its main attack is Confusion. This is brilliant! One interesting inclusion, however, is the talk mechanic. This will allow you to actually talk to your enemies instead of outright killing them, but it's not just a gimmick. It actually affects what ending you will get in the story. In the neutral route, only Kel forgives Sunny. In the good ending, both of them forgive Sunny. But in the bad ending, Hero commits self-oof. Omori Requiem is perhaps one of the most intriguing and interesting ideas for an Omori fan game I've ever seen. It takes place right after the bad ending of Omori, as the son is about to commit infinite Oyasumi. <laughs> but right as he's about to jump, Aubrey stops him. I never really imagined any situation where Aubrey would actually forgive Sunny because she literally changed her entire persona because of Mori's death, so I would imagine how she would react to the truth. But I feel like if she saw just how guilt-ridden Sunny really was, she would have been far more inclined to forgiving him. Unfortunately though, this idea was completely scrapped because some person in the dev team was a jerk apparently, so they basically scrapped all of his contributions, both story-wise and art-wise. The game was kinda rebranded as Omori Cognitive Dissonance, but it's like on hiatus, but it's not on hiatus. I don't know, it's odd. Let's go back to the roots again, with the Omori manga. It's ironic how Omori started off as a web blog, and then evolved into a manga, and then a proper video game. There were clear intentions of expanding Omori's horizons and story, which is surprising, because Omori is getting a proper manga adaptation. The announcement came on Omori's official Twitter account. The manga will be serialized under the Seinen magazine of Kodansha Monthly Afternoon, but who's the person making it? Well, uh, it's none other than the legendary mangaka himself. Nui Konoito. Legendary as in there is absolutely nothing fucking known about him. There is no name, there is no age, experience, works, nothing. This person might as well not fucking exist. The manga is set to release in 2024, so I guess we'll see how things turn out then. Hey viewer, are you depressed with Omori content right now because a lot of things can be very depressing in this story? So let me just give you a break with this sponsor segment that is sponsored by my fanbase. Most notably, Nisp told me to include this very specific gif about Fumos. Fumos are high quality plush developed by Angel Type, now known as Royal Cat. And they manufacture these and they're basically a icon, they're everywhere, they're a meme. And there's also this one guy who uh, told me to include the CME's cat because he would give me Binding of Isaac and I agreed, so here is the, the, the cat. Omocat drama. In the gaming industry, drama is as common as the rain and uh, I don't know anymore, this video is too fucking long. Drama is apparent in every sphere of gaming, from that big AAA with Baldur's Gate 3, Elden Goat and so many more, but unfortunately, 
That drama could trickle down to smaller developers like Omocat. Back like 10 years ago, Omocat made questionable tweets regarding little boys wishing to be Dorifloon so that she could kidnap them. On top of that, she released t-shirts with the caption Shota, which is essentially lolicons but for female version. I don't know how to think about that. Obviously, she received backlash for this, and while she did apologize, we all know Twitter doesn't forget things that easily. Let's put that on the burner for now, cause a new enemy arrived. Melon! I'm gonna keep this brief because, again, there's a lot of text stuff and I really can't edit this shit properly. I'm not leafy to make it entertaining with just CSGO surfing. So just to keep it short, the Melon came out and said how Omocat completely removed her royalties about the game. But here's the thing, Melon did not work properly on the game. According to these screenshots and what Omocat said, they worked a lot on the game for the first few months or so of Omori's development. But then, uh, she just started slagging off. She missed deadlines because one of her excuses was, Oh, I just fell asleep on my keyboard. That is literally what she says. Are you a fucking child? So ultimately, she comes out and says how their royalties were completely removed. But then the screenshots show that they were never removed at all. They were simply shrunken because Omocat had to pay her for not doing proper work, had to pay her for the things she added without actually having permission to add those things, and then had to be paid to remove those features. So Omocat literally just lost money on nothing. So bottom of the story, uh, um, Melon bed. But uh, remember the Pokemon incident? The Shoto thing? Yeah, that's about to come up again. Omocat on her Twitter account posted how she will be doing a livestream on her drawing all 100 original Pokemon models off of memory. And when that happened, everyone remembered about the Drifloon incident. So a lot of people went on to actually just dog on Omocat for the things she did 10 fucking years ago, which is dumb, people change. And as a result, Omocat unrightfully came out and said that she apologizes for her past actions. But you know who are more dedicated than Twitter people trying to cancel others? The Omori fanbase. Before Omori's full release, in 2019, a beta build was available for some to play. You would imagine that there would be a bunch of differences between the beta and the full release, right? Simple enough, of course there would be. But did you know that the community wrote a 600-page Google document detailing each and every single difference between the two? Why? Get a job! Now for the most fascinating secrets I've uncovered in this community. To get to Red Maze, which is one of the most infamous areas within Omori, you just have to randomly walk off this path and you'll spawn there. There are plenty of these types of secrets by the way. Become AFK in this spot for 143 seconds, which takes you to a new area. Like, how do you people actually come up with this shit? It doesn't make sense. But that's just physical discoveries. What about something more subtle, more right under your nose. Well, look no further than the Phobia OSTs. These boss fights titled Something appears very infrequently throughout the game. They represent different fears Sunny has about different things, such as drowning, spiders, and heights. These boss fights seemingly don't have much in the way of having a proper OST, but a lot of people discovered something absolutely amazing. If you grab these seemingly background sound effects, and if you overlap them whilst making them 400% faster, you get this banger. It is so fucking good, and to have this a secret that people have to discover is so brave on Omocat's part. It gives me from softer vibes almost. What is even more amazing is how someone actively thought that maybe this would be actual music, so they just cut this thing out and experimented. I absolutely love this community. And that's virtually it for what the internet did to Omori. I did miss a lot of things, various secrets, Hikigomori route, animations, memes, fan art, but a lot of them are just way too decentralized that I physically couldn't cover all of them, and just covering a few would do the community a disservice. Omori's community reminds me a lot of Undertales. Both were being developed back in 2014 and both were inspired by Earthbound. And both of them reached critical success because of their originality. The fanbase similarly reflects this passion and creativity, with various people reimagining these characters in a million different lenses. These characters, for many, many people, are more than sprites. They represent hurdles, joys, and endings. Omori's creation itself can be viewed as an allegory for change, progression, and evolution. Going from a simple blog, to a manga, then a game, and finally, a message which resonates with millions of people. 
So I think the point is clear now. We need Omori 2. I hate overtime.